Good morning. Uh, it's very nice to see, or good afternoon, it's very nice to see so many people here. I would have expected, uh, given the night that most people seem to have had last night, judging by the news, that I would have had maybe 12 people, all of whom uh, weren't from here, uh, to, to talk to today. So it's really nice to see most of you, which is great. Um, what we're going to do today is look uh, very uh, quickly at banking and macro crises and uh, talk about insolvencies and credit-driven collapses. But before we do that, let me talk a little bit about um, the book reviews and a little bit about the student evaluation feedbacks. So the first is we got all the book reviews and um, we've been reading them. We've been incredibly impressed with some. We've been deeply depressed with others. But with over 300 people in the class, that's not, to be, that's not uh, unexpected. Um, so that's very good. Um, we, we have, um, we have quite a bit of reading to do, so you should expect feedback from us by uh, week 10. So thank you for that, and keep sending in your case studies. Um, the other thing is in regards to the student evaluations. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, 99 people out of the 300 filled out the, um, the student evaluation uh, survey. I got it done in the, in the first couple of weeks of this, le of this series so that I would have feedback that would help you individually and you as a class. And the, the, the core feedback that people wanted um, <coughs> Uh, one was I'd like a textbook. Um, I'd love I'd love if you I'd love to set you a textbook that was right. There are no right textbooks. They're all wrong. Um, everything that has been written about economics pre two thousand and eight is more or less wrong. So that's why I haven't set you a textbook. I would love to write you one, but I haven't got time. Um, so so there's nothing I can do about that. But I do acknowledge that it is an issue. The second thing that people wanted was more, was more of a correspondence between lectures and tutorials. Specifically, people wanted um, uh, tutorials where if you were feeling a bit lost about a particular model or a particular theory that I went through in the lectures, you could go through with the tutors, uh, or with the TAs. Um, now, this is something that we can provide, and we will provide it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to change some of the feedback sessions into recap sessions where you, instead of going to talk to your TAs about book reviews and things like that, you can actually uh, go and get recaps of the lectures that we've done uh, to this point. My logic, by the way, for not doing the recap uh, thing was that there seems to be a culture in UL, and I, don't, I, 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 I know, of course, that none of you subscribe to this, um, which is I'll skip the lecture and go to the tutorial because it's the same stuff anyway. Um, that, that seems to me to be a fundamental waste of time. Paying, paying people to do the same thing over and over again. If you wanted to recap my lectures, they're all available online uh, as recordings, so you can just read them again. However, I do acknowledge that it's a serious concern some, some students have in terms of getting concepts. Um, and if you only hear it once or twice, uh, that may be a bit, more, um, a bit more difficult. So we're going to arrange recap tutorials for you uh, in the coming weeks, and I'll have some more details for you on that. So it's it's a good it's a, it's it's a good. I hope that you realise that that's a concrete suggestion that several of you made through the student evaluation teaching uh, form that is going to have an effect right now on your student experience. Okay. So the more of these things you do, and the earlier that lecturers get them, the more we can respond to your feedback. Okay. Uh, let, us, let me move on then to talk about uh, banking and macro um, in particular. Uh, and uh, by the way, it's a great week to talk about banking and macro. The uh, chairman of AIB, the CEO of AIB, David Duffy, was in, in front of the uh, houses of the Oireachtas giving evidence this week, and he said something to the effect of, Asher, we're grand. Don't worry, lads, it'll all work out. Um, AIB is currently in the process of... Um, slimming down, and I'd, I'd like to show you some, some of the details that uh, they've been providing, actually. Um, it's in the process of slimming down uh, rather, rather, rather a lot. Here, here, is the, uh, here is the stuff that they were talking about, um, and you can see, you can see that uh, in terms of the, maybe I can make it smaller, in terms of the, this is AIB now, post-crisis AIB that you all own, if you're Irish taxpayers, 
Um, total assets in December 2007, 178 billion. Total assets in June 2012, 130 billion. It's slimming down. It's deleveraging, which is something that we're going to talk about a lot. In terms of its loan to deposit ratio, that was at 157%. So for every 100 euros that they had, they still had to get off 50, 57 euros from somewhere else. And they thought that this was sustainable. And this is down to a mere 125%. So a 20% drop. So you can, see, you can see that the size of the loan book, its assets, loans, customer accounts, have been dropping. Shareholder equity has uh, increased because the shareholders are now you and me. And tier one, which is, which is the, uh, the amount of money, basically the high quality money that's on the books, that went from 6% to 18% or 17%. So we're, the, we're some of the best capitalized banks in Europe, um, thanks to the Irish taxpayer. Now, you will also be aware that they will be uh, seeking redundancies. Uh, you can see that they are uh, uh, getting rid of around 2,500 people, and they're also going to change their deposits. Hands up here who have bank accounts with AIB. Whoa, fully two, three quarter, two thirds of the class, I'd say, have. Have bank accounts with them. They are telling you, your, your, this is your bank in many ways. <laughs> they're telling you that they're going to pay you less for your deposits uh, in the next little while. Remember, I talked about the 363 model. Bankers should take deposits at 3%, lend at 6%, and hit the golf course at 3 p.m. That's the basic idea of banking, right? And their problem is they've been lending at 3%, taking deposits at 6%. And hit in the golf course at 3 a.m. So this is the big problem. So they need to change this, and they're they're going to do it. But one of the ways they're going to do it is by decreasing the amount of interest that you get as a depositor. So so that that'll be quite interesting. And they need to make several savings. Uh, and you can see you can see the problem. It's right here. Here is their cost of funds. It's going up. Okay, their cost of funds <coughs> is going up. It's more expensive to be a bank today. That's the problem. More expensive to be a bank today. The average market rate is 4.3%. They're at four. They're losing money the whole time, which is why the variable mortgage holder is getting a hard time. Importantly for you guys, I think, um, especially as you come out into the world of work, it's gonna be very, very interesting for you to deal with banks that simply do not want to lend. Okay, this is Philippe Hildebrandt. Up until last year, probably one of the most respected central bankers in the world. Uh, got himself into a little bit of trouble when his wife, who is a stockbroker, decided to uh, buy and sell shares uh, based on insider information that he would have told her as the head of the Swiss central bank. So Philippe got the sack, or le sac. And now he's gone, but he has this lovely quote. I really like it, actually. Recurring financial crises are a hallmark of the modern financial system. It would seem that every five years or so, a 100-year event destabilizes the system. Moreover, each crisis appears more violent than the previous one. This is true because it is true. Hildebrand is, is, is exactly correct in what he's saying. Here's what I want you to learn. Would you all please write down the first sentence? If you get this, you get the rest of the lecture. Just, just understand this and you'll understand the rest. Credit creates its own reversal. This is what you must understand. This is the point of my lecture today. Um, this is the point of my lecture today. Okay. Um, credit creates its own reversal. <coughs> now you saw last week, you saw last week that... Um, The interaction of leverage, liquidity, and crisis, and solvency leads to crisis. You saw this as part of the lecture that we did last week. And the way, basically, the way that Keynes talked about it in terms of causality was that changes in money supply and money demand, particularly demand for credit, altered the price level, which affected the interest rate, which affected the, uh, which affected the inflation rate, which affects the nominal interest rate, and that changes money demand. So there's a feedback. 
Three weeks ago, we looked carefully at the role of feedbacks in economic systems. The reason that we did that was because you cannot understand how finance and macro interact without understanding feedbacks. If you get this idea, this is core, if you get this idea, then you get the rest of the interaction between banking and finance. There is a problem, which we'll talk about in a minute. Credit creates its own reversal. You already know from last week the interaction of credit and leverage and liquidity lead to crisis. And finally, there is a causal structure, like a domino effect. One thing hits the other, which hits the other, which hits the other, which hits the other, and suddenly the whole thing falls apart. And this is the causality that I want to understand and talk about in this lecture. This idea of one thing causing another, if then. Now, in the 1800s, a chap called Walter Badgett, if you read The Economist magazine, there is a column called Badgett, and Badgett himself started The Economist. Um, so he was a pretty gifted guy, he was also a financier. And he wrote this amazing book called Lombard Street. You can get it for free online. Uh, it's, it's a very old book, but it's a great book. And it's a book written by a stockbroker. So most stockbrokers tend not to be sort of Dickensian in their, pro, in their prose. He speaks in a very stripped down way because he's talking for the average guy. And so it's a very understandable, very readable book. But his essential problem is that credit systems are much more delicate at some times than at others. Panics come according to a fixed rule. Every 10 years or so, we must have them. Now, this is important because last year, you were taught that the market is an equilibrium system. In other words, the market is always tending towards an equilibrium. If you knock it out of its equilibrium, it comes back. If you knock it into its equilibrium, it shoots past the equilibrium and comes back up. What this is telling you is, even in equilibrium, the system will go along and then kaboom, it'll explode on its own. The system has its own, the seeds of its own destruction um, within it. And Badgett is a, a, a really, really interesting exponent of this. If you had read Badgett, you wouldn't have believed the nonsense that was coming out of Irish economists and Irish bankers and Irish property people in the early 2000s. You would not have believed it because you would have realized this is a bubble. Sadly, like most great books, no one reads Badger. Another great book uh, that was forgotten was a book called Stabilizing an Unstable Economy by this dude, Hyman Minsky. Hyman Minsky was a Harvard PhD student, studied under the Nobel laureate Wassily Leontiev, had two amazing papers out of his PhD, and then promptly disappeared, totally from the intellectual map of the United States economics profession. He wound up as a professor at Kansas, uh, uh, sorry, in St. Louis, and he died a very bitter man because he had this idea that the market was always going to blow up. And when he died, he was proven wrong, or he died, he thought he was proven wrong. A few years later, um, maybe five, six years after he died, a term was coined. It was called the Minsky moment uh, in honor of his theory. But here's the theory. He's a, here's the theory. So Minsky's a rather tragic figure in the history of economic thought in the sense that he lived his whole life thinking that his ideas were never going to be taken up. And now he has people like me ranting to people like you a mere decade after he died. So here's this big idea. The big idea is that credit creates its own reversal. The second big idea is that the debt structure of firms matters. So there's a theorem. It's called the Modigliani-Miller theorem. You don't need to know what the Modigliani-Miller theorem is. You just need to know what it says. It says that the gearing of firms doesn't matter. You'll all be aware what gearing is. But just to remind you, if you have uh, uh, lots of debt relative to equity or very little debt relative to equity, your gearing is different. It's about how much uh, uh, the, what, your what the, the loan structure of your company is, is like. Modigliani Miller says that doesn't matter. Um, Minsky said, yeah, it does matter, actually. The debt structure really matters. The market is naturally unstable. It booms and it busts, exactly as Badgett said. 
importantly, especially in the case of the current presidential debate in the US, the only things that stop the economy from blowing up are the presence of big banks and big governments. So just before the First World War, it looked like there was going to be a Great Depression. There was a financial collapse. And one banker, a guy called JP Morgan, literally the JP Morgan, rocked up to some of his friends and said, let's organize a, a, a liquidity injection into the markets. And he did. And it saved the stock market from collapsing. Big banks like the central bank in Europe or the central bank in the United States stop crises from happening. Anybody that's interested in this stuff, read uh, Mario Draghi's interview in Der Spiegel over the weekend. It's an amazing interview. Der Spiegel is a, is a bit like the Irish Daily Mail. You know, they have that kind of, you know, I'm annoyed! Why? I'm just am! You know, these, these kind of people. I'm disgustified! They listen to Joe Duffy a lot. Disgustified Joe! You know, that sort of stuff. I don't like people with ears! You know, whatever. You know, all this sort of stuff. Um, so, uh, Der Spiegel is simply saying, why are you using our taxpayers' money to bail out these profligate, lazy Greeks, Irish, Portuguese, Spanish, Italians, anybody who's not us, basically? And you can imagine Mario Draghi's reaction, which is to go, <laughs> shut up. It's a great interview. Um, very, very good interview. But Draghi outlines exactly why the European Central Bank is being so activist. Why is the European Central Bank getting involved in buying bonds? Why is it doing these things? Why is it signing up to be the regulator for 6,000 banks? Because it's the only one who can. It's the big bank. So it dampens the cycle. It stops the economy from exploding. The other thing that stops it is big government. Now, big government is important. Lots of people think the Irish government isn't very big. Actually, as a percentage of GDP, it is very big. It's very big. Um, it extends all over the economy. And if you took it out, the economy would collapse. Many of us de de depend crucially on the government. And what's really interesting about the U United States presidential election, which I alluded to earlier, which is the people who don't believe in big government are the exact people who are now being saved by the big government. And once that happens, they'll go back to not wanting to pay for these services. It's a kind of a, it's a, it's a mad country. But anyway, the big government dampens the cycle via the automatic stabilizer mechanisms that we talked about before. Booms and busts are the inevitable result of institutionally legitimized high risk lending practices. Why is it institutionally legitimized? Because the last time there was a boom, the last time things went crazy, what <coughs> happened to you? Imagine that you are a banker. It is your job to lend money. Interest rates are low. The more that you lend, the bigger your bonuses are. You, your bonuses, not the banks, yours, your bonus, Stephen Kensington, your bonuses. The more you lend, the bigger the bonuses are. Eventually, you say to yourself, hold on a second, stole the digger. What happens if the loans don't come back? You go to your manager, you say, what if the loans don't come back? We're talking about hundreds and tens of tens of billions of euros here. What will happen? And the manager says, fuck it. It's grand. Look back in history. If we blow up, they have to save us. We'll be grand. It's, we'll be fine. The game is to get so big that you are too big to fail. That is the game. You cannot, you cannot leave this lecture without understanding this. The game, if you're a banker, is to lend so much that the government has to, has to bail you out. And if you think about it that way, if you institutionally legitimize high risk lending, then that is what you will get the next time. And so here's the Minsky cycle. Here's how you, under you should understand this. How do credit markets breed their own reversal? How does this work? Okay. Well, it's actually pretty simple. It's actually pretty simple. Imagine that there has been some 
boom in the past that has gone bust and things have gone wrong and it's all just blown up on ourselves, right? Well, things calm down. Things calm down. And essentially, something happens. There's a displacement. And that cheap interest rates lead to increased lending. Once you have more lending, you have an increase in leverage. The increase in leverage leads to really perverse incentives. So you have loads and loads and loads of dodgy lending. Okay? That's the important thing you have to remember. There are some good projects which need to get funded by banks. Then there are some okay projects which need to get funded by banks. And there are some really dodgy projects which nobody anywhere should be lending. For example, I had dealings with a 58-year-old lady last year who has a heart condition, who has an income of two and a half, had an income of two and a half thousand euros a month, who was given a 25-year mortgage in June of 2007 for nearly a half a million euros. So her mortgage was almost 95% of her income. That's really stupid. She, she lasted, I think, two months before she started uh, defaulting on her loan. Now, if you think about this, who's at fault here? The lady who went in and signed her name on the dotted line? Absolutely, she's at fault. She's an adult. Nobody put a gun to her head and said, buy this stupid piece of property. <coughs> but imagine, the, imagine that she decides today to go to the bank. And she rocks up to the bank and she says, hi, how's it going? I'm 58 years old. I have an income. I have an income of three grand a month, let's say, with inflation. And I want to take out a mortgage for 2,800 a month. Do you think they'd even give her the form? Do you think they'd even go, yeah, fill out the form? They wouldn't even give her a pen. They'd probably drop kick her out the door. Right? She's 58 years old. You can imagine. You know, kick her out the door. Um, so... Who's really to blame? The person who, who takes the money because they're always going to want to take money or the person who lends it out. Banks have a fiduciary responsibility to stop this from happening, okay? But banks don't want to stop this from happening. They have perverse incentives. It makes loads of sense for them to do this because they personally benefit. No matter how many loans they give out, they personally benefit today. Let stuff blow up in the future. The guys got their benefit. The guys got their bonuses in 2007. Okay, they bought their houses, they bought their cars, they sent their kids to school. Whatever. The point is, they got their money now. This problem is blowing up in 2012. You all see the issue. Who's dealing with it? You are. I am. So now, there's a bit of a boom. Everybody goes mad, and then something changes. Something changes. Some dodgy loans default, somebody pays too much. Banks fail, and things go mad. If banks fail, let, by the way, by the way, none of you know what a failing bank looks like. You think a failed bank is like Anglo-Irish Bank. But here's what a failed bank looks like. You have a deposit in Steve's bank. You have a mortgage with Steve Bank. You go on a Tuesday to Steve Bank to take out your money, and it's not there. That's a failed bank. Your mortgage has been sold to <coughs> Peter Bank, who's going to, uh, who's going to say, hi, <laughs> guess what your interest rates are? Yeah, it's gonna be a hard time for you. Several banks have failed in the US, and two banks have failed in Denmark, actually. Um, but most banks get bailed out. And the reason that they get bailed out is because if my bank account is in trouble, the first person I go and talk to after my bank is my TD. So here are the five stages in Minsky's model of the credit cycle. And would you please write this down? It's very important to remember this. And the reason that it's important to remember this, this uh, is that this is going to happen again. It's going to happen to you, not to the economy, to you. You are the economy. The same way, I think last week I was talking about, you know, people talk about, I'm really in traffic. You're not in traffic. You are traffic. Okay? If you're sitting in traffic, you are traffic. It is not the economy. You are the economy. Okay? 
There's five stages in Minsky's model. Number one, displacement. In our case, now by the way, this, this could fit, Minsky in his 1986 book, fit this to four other uh, crises moments, but I'm gonna take ours. Displacement, what was the displacement? The displacement was two planes driving into two buildings in, tw in 2001. There was a worldwide recession following the September the 11th attacks. A coordinated decrease of, mo of interest rates across the world, from the Fed to the ECB to the Bank of Japan, all over the world, reduced interest rates. This caused a huge surge in lending, which led appropriately to an increase in output, exactly via the ISLM mechanism that you would have studied uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Which is exactly what monetary policy is supposed to do, a short-term decrease or increase in interest rates in order to affect the <coughs> short-term output. Exactly right. However, the interest rates never got pulled back up. They, they, made, they were maintained artificially low. And in Ireland and all the peripheral states like Portugal, Spain, Greece, Hungary, uh, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, people went, oh my God, this is ridiculous. And they started borrowing. And the banks were delighted to lend because they were making money. They were borrowing short, lending long. So the displacement led inevitably to a boom. The boom where you had lots, lots of two skinny women with blonde hair, all called Sorka, Nisha, something like this, going, stunning, stunning. They, they were property programs all over the shop. There was a property supplement, this, uh, the, the width of your elbow, in every, in every newspaper. People were talking about property, it was ridiculous. Oh my God, Sorka, isn't it stunning? It is indeed, yes, stunning. Everything is stunning. This is where Ross O'Carroll Kelly comes from. If you want to understand modern Ireland, you have to read Ross O'Carroll Kelly. People think it's like holiday reading. Actually, it's more like Flan O'Brien, kind of packed with the devil. <laughs> Third policeman type stuff. Anyway, um, with some dick jokes thrown in for the crack. Anyway, euphoria. Euphoria, what was the euphoria? Well, the euphoria in particular was 2005 to 2007, when people were running around going, oh my God, sir, it's amazing. We can buy a two bedroom apartment on a train track for a mere half a mil. It's amazing, sir. I know, Nigel, stunning. Anyway, another important point, which I'm often asked, is where did the money go, <laughs> Steve? Where did all this money go? You, you know, where did the money go? Profit taking. People bought land at inflated prices. Who did they buy the land off? The landowners. Who had a lot of land at the time? Farmers, in some cases. And so there are anecdotal, uh, there are anecdotal uh, uh, stories of farmer A with plot of land B, and farmer A is offered three million for the plot of land upon which one horse is sitting. And farmer A goes, fuck it, sure I will. And he does. Farmer A is now offered back the land from the bank for 50 grand. Uh, because the bank need to get rid of this land because the, the idea was there was going to be a, a shopping centre on top of a car park, on top of a space station on this thing. But no, it's still a field in Tullamore, like, you know, with the same cow, you know, or horse, whatever, looking. And so Farmer A can't afford it. They go, but we gave you three million. They go, Farmer A... Uh, Farmer A says, well, I invested in an anglo Irish bank, <laughs> so we lost it all. So the money, some people made huge amounts of money in this, and some people are very, very wealthy. A lot of people invested in bank shares because that was the safe thing, and they lost it all. So it was gone. It's been diffused back into the system. And finally, five, panic. Does anybody know what the moment of panic was in Ireland? Does anybody know? Pardon? 207, what happened to 207? Oh, you're th you're, so you're thinking of two th September 2008? Yeah, sorry. yeah it, was, it was a bit before that. Actually, it was about a year before that. Essentially, what happened was um, Anglo Irish Bank, um, Anglo Irish Bank was, was, was in deep trouble. They had, they had repoed all their assets back through the ECB as much as they could. They were, they were trying to keep the show on the road, but it was, it was drastically falling apart. If anybody's interested, read Simon Carswell's Anglo Republic. It's a superb book that details this um, very, very, very well. And essentially what happened was 
Once people realized that Anglo was no longer able to, re to, to, to lend money at unlimited rates, everybody went, shit, and that was it. It was over. It was over in a matter of weeks. The panic has essentially not stopped since. This is the annual growth of total private sector credit. That black line here is what you should look at. It is essentially a bubble. You can see that private sector credit was growing, sometimes 30% growth in private sector credit. People were borrowing and lending like it was crazy, you know, and all the way down now. You can see this, this blue line here is non-financial corporates. So this is basically SMEs. This green line is financial intermediation. So this is you buying, you know, uh, SSIAs or subprime mortgages or CDOs or derivatives or options or whatever. Okay? And this is property. Yay! Ooh, not so much. So you can see it's on the slide now. And it's been on the slide since. Now, there is a lovely, lovely model which I want to show to you. It is called the multiplier accelerator model. The algebra is here, and you can go through it yourselves, but I want to show you an example of it in a second. <coughs> Essentially, it is combined of two simple equations. The first equation here is consumption. So consumption at any point t is just initial consumption plus c times yt minus 1. So your initial consumption plus some term times your income in the last period. I let, so I will, I'll consume... <laughs> Uh, 60. So it'll be 60 euros worth of stuff. So that'll be uh, 10 euros, which I'll need to live on anyway, plus uh, 0.5. So C would be 0.5 times yt minus 1, which is 100. If I earned 100 in the last period. So that would be 60 is equal to 10 plus 50. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? That's what this is. So the y there is a variable, c0 is a constant. And that little c there is a parameter. It changes, like 0.5. And if c is 0.5, it means you consume 50% of your income, and you save 50% of your income. This here, second thing, is investment. So investment at any time t is some initial investment, which you can think of as investment for depreciation, replacing computers and damaged um, uh, capital goods. And then B here, which is this thing, which we'll call the speed of adjustment, times consumption in time T minus consumption in time T minus 1. Plug these two things together using the identity Y is equal to C plus I, because there's no G, there's no X, there's no M. You all know, because I've beaten it into your heads, that Y is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Plug those two things in, rearrange, and you get this. YT is equal to the constant terms plus i minus b and c y t minus 1, which is equal to this. This is very important, folks. What this means is, the reason that this is called a multiplier accelerator is because imagine that there's an increase in c. If there's an increase in c, an increase in the marginal propensity to consume, so everybody does this big euphoria thing, wait, let's all get, you know, hammered and buy new fridges and get, you know, uh, um, various things done to ourselves, liposuction and whatnot, um, that increases. But what happens when things start, the, the speed of things start increasing? So you start selling stuff to each other. So you've got this multiplier effect because the marginal propensity to consume is the multiplier, you'll remember from last year, and you've got this accelerator thing. So things are speeding up at a faster rate. The important thing about the multiplier accelerator model is that it's unstable. It's really, really unstable. And it can explode. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Here, oh, you can see it, cool. Here is a little, maybe I'll make it bigger. Here's a little difference equation. So uh, don't worry what a difference equation is. It's not a big deal. You don't uh, necessarily need to worry about it. But, where's the view? Zoom. Cool. This stupid thing. Right. So, 
here we have some time periods. Okay? And the way it works is the way it works is yt is equal to 80 minus a times yt minus 1. So output in time t is equal to 80 minus a, which is some parameter times yt, minus byt minus 2. So you get this, you get this weird effect. Okay? So you can see what's happening is the system is cycling. You have booms and busts. Now, importantly, folks, there is no shock term in this. There's nothing, there's nothing that come, that's coming along and going, shock. There's no, if you've done some maths, there's no stochastic element to any of this. Okay? In fact, what there is, is a, ra a rather large amount of randomness. So if we change A from 0.1 to 0.3, we can see that the system doesn't cycle that much. If we change it to 0.9, you can see that things calm down a bit. Yeah? The cycle calms down. What happens if we increase this to 1.4? We cause a huge spike down here. And what happens is, what happens is, the past effects, because B is multiplied by YT minus 2. So if YT was 2010, YT minus 1 would be 2009, YT minus 2 would be 2008. So it's repeating on you. Yeah, it's repeating on you. So, so, so the wiggles get worse over time. They multiply and accelerate. They get worse over time. Okay? And we can increase it again, just for the crack. Make it one. You can see all you're doing is changing the phase. What happens if this becomes two? I think I break the entire system, do I? No. And you can see now, nothing, nothing, nothing. Short is grand, buy more houses, stunning. Oh, 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 all gone. I use that in the technical sense that you should. So you see, you see, just through a combination of linear elements, you can end up with a very non-linear uh, and very strange uh, system. Okay? So, asset bubbles, fictions, absolute lies, ridiculous, ridiculous insanities, the best is yet to come, etc., etc. Favorable demographics. We've got loads of young people. They're coming on board. They want to, you know, the birth rate is so high. People were believing this crap. The birth rate is so high. Because when a baby comes out, the first thing it thinks is, I want to buy a house. They're like there's not a 20 year lag. Scarce quality land. Does anybody feel like there's a scarce of, scarcity of land in Ireland at the moment? Ideal locations. You know, you've got Kalini or whatever. New financial instruments. Oh, this is the way forward, lads. CDOs, junk bonds. This is the brilliant stuff. This time is different. So I've got a book with Tony Ledden called Understanding Ireland's Economic Crisis. If you're interested in the, de the stuff behind this, uh, have a read of it. Okay. So into the fray marches Nobel laureate Paul Krugman and significantly less well-known but very clever person Gauti Egerton. And they, they tell this story. Here's the basic story. Lots of people. There are lots of people and they all want debt. Everybody wants to own the dream home. There's something about Ireland. You're not complete as a person until you have your own septic tank. You know? You have to have like a quarter of an acre around you. Otherwise, you're in some sense a failure, I think, culturally. It's very strange. And I, I, I know people on the continent are going to go, why do you do this? But we don't know. Something in our genes tells us to. So... There's suddenly a drop in the debt limit. So the debt limit in Ireland was sort of, I think, 10 times your, your average income. If your income was like 50 grand, you could borrow 500,000, you know, if, that, if that's what your income was. Then that dropped to maybe eight, so 400,000, and now I think it's about six, okay? You just can't borrow that kind of stuff. And so it's a natural story for the crisis. There's a temporary negative natural rate of interest. People are just happy to lend money. Now, what happens is, what happens is, the interest rate should go negative. The interest rate should adjust net into a negative space to actually suck money out of the economy. But the interest rate can't do that. You can't have a negative rate of interest. So it bounces. It bounces off the, off the liquidity trap, which we studied, I think, three weeks ago. It bounces off the lower bound, 
And that causes a paradox of thrift and a paradox of toil. Check out the Irish Economy blog today. I have a blog post up about uh, a, se a set of models, actually I'll show it to you, a set of models which, um, ooh, a set of models set of models that's recently been done about this. Here's what they showed. They showed what would happen to Ireland based on uh, an increase in fiscal consolidation. In other words, G minus T, they, they brought it down at a faster rate. And here's what they see. This thing here shows you the difference in percentages of GDP. So this is like a, a, a debt scenario, okay? And what they show is, <coughs> What they show is everybody cutting their spending at the same time is stupid. That is the paradox of thrift. If everybody here had 100 euros in their pocket, there's, let's say there's 150 people in this room. If everybody here had a, uh, 100 euros in their pocket and you all spent 100 euros and there's 150 people, GDP is 150 times 100. People are like, <laughs> 15,000, yeah, okay. Now, if you guys decide to reduce your spending from, there's like 10 of you, let's say, you decide to reduce your spending from 100 to 50. GDP drops, right? But it drops by 10 times 50. 500, so you've got 15,000 minus 500. GDP isn't that effective. If everybody here decides to stop spending, if you drop your spending from 100 to 50, GDP goes from 15,000 to 7,500. That, folks, is the paradox of thrift. By individually wanting, by individually wanting to save, to, to, to reduce our spending relative to our incomes, we cause a huge collapse in consumption. Yeah? which collapses GDP, which increases unemployment, blah, 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 blah. So this, it's, it's an important point. And what it shows, what this chart shows, ladies and gentlemen, is that Ireland is the only country in the entire series where physical consolidation is a good thing. They're, what they're saying is we are, we are, things are so bad in Ireland that by, by us <coughs> reducing our expenditure, we're actually getting ourselves into a pretty good space in terms of our debt on us. Pretty important point to make, actually. But I urge you to read that anyway, because it's, it's, it's quite an interesting point uh, to make. Okay. So, there's this paradox of thrift and a paradox of toil, which is the kind of the same thing. And I show you a link down there uh, to the paper. You should all read it. What, what, what Krugman shows is that in a depression, in a depression, the standard model is wrong. That's what Krugman is showing. In a depression, aggregate demand is sloping up. Now, if you wrote this down in an exam, <laughs> if any of you wrote this down in an exam, I would fail your asses. I would fail you. Paul Krugman won the John Bates Clark Medal and the Nobel Prize in Economics. He can write this stuff down. You can't. Okay? Or maybe he won the Nobel Prize because he can write this stuff down. I don't know. Anyway, the important point is, what he's showing is that in terms of inflation and output, if you try to increase aggregate demand, if you try to increase aggregate demand in this world, you're going to be in trouble. He has the paradox of toil. If everybody works more, it actually leads to a lower level of a work equilibrium. Aggregate supply in this world, an increase in aggregate supply doesn't increase. It doesn't increase. Uh, uh, the, 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 the world that we're in at all. It doesn't help. Why? Because aggregate demand is fundamentally damaged, which is exactly what it's like here in Ireland right now. Aggregate demand is banjaxed. And the reason that it's banjaxed is because 15% of the population are unemployed and everyone else is up to their necks in debt. Okay? The paradox of flexibility. If you make prices more flexible, you actually make things worse. In, 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 in Truckman's world, okay? Which is a very unpleasant place to be. Now, what's the lesson? 
Printing money does nothing at the zero bound. So it's not going to be a big deal. It's not a big deal to print a load of money, which is really interesting because if you read the Der Spiegel article with President Mario Draghi, the first thing they're saying is, don't print money, it'll cause a hyperinflation. And Draghi's saying, chill, I got this. They're going, no, 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 it'll be back to the Weimar Republic. Ah, I say, no, relax. Printing money does nothing at zero, okay? But you can do a lot by committing to future inflation, by saying, in the future, we will. Or the future low number of rates. This seems to be hard and pretty practice. And there's a credibility problem. A credibility problem. The final and most important point, folks, is that when you're in this world, tax and spending multipliers will be high. If you believe this story of the world, you should go out and build as many stadia as you can, because the bang for your buck is really high at this point. It's really, really high. So there's another model, which I'd like to show you, but I don't have time. And also, because I wrote it, and I'm not Paul Krugman, I think following him is a bit of a waste. You can check this model out if you like, um, and we show some interesting scenarios, but um, it's not that important. Okay, folks, thank you very much, and I shall see you all on Monday. Have a good weekend.